Welcome to day 12 of 23 Days with God. I'm Chris Duffy, the director of Masterpiece Ministry, which is Chapel Street's ministry for those impacted by disability. Today we're going to be exploring the omnipotence of God, but before we get into that, let's open our time with God's Word. When I first think about the omnipotence of God, the Sunday School answer that comes to mind is all-powerful. But what does that really mean, and how does this attribute of God apply to our daily lives as followers and disciples of Jesus? On its face, all-powerful seems straightforward enough, right? I wish it was really that simple. The reality is, is for me, I start running into bumps and potholes almost immediately. Do I see God as a superhero? who has mysterious powers, rescues people, and can save the planet? Charles Spurgeon opens his sermon on mercy, omnipotence, and justice, saying that great works of art, like paintings or music, require some education of the observer before they can be thoroughly appreciated. He suggests at times those listening to wonderful harmonies may in reality be clownish listeners. There are certainly times when I've considered God's omnipotence and thought, yep, I'm a clownish listener. As we begin to meditate and work to understand God's omnipotence, we might start running into challenges. For example, when we think about God's goodness, which we'll hear about in a few days, we might struggle knowing there is much suffering in the world he spoke into existence. We might wonder, isn't God powerful enough to remove this pain and suffering? The answer is yes, he surely is powerful enough. The question becomes, why doesn't he? In Nahum 1.3, we're told, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Slow to anger and judging the wicked on the surface seem to be somewhat contrary. Spurgeon in the sermon I referenced earlier makes the case that the quality of slow to anger and finding the wicked guilty is tethered together by God's great power, his omnipotence. It's that great power that enables God to be slow to anger. He will not send a Jonah to Nineveh until Nineveh has become foul with sin. Consider the scene in the Garden of Eden at the time of the fall. God had threatened Adam that if he sinned, he would surely die. Adam sinned. Did God make haste to sentence him? Instead, we see the Lord God walking in the garden in the, cool of, in the cool of the day. As a parent, I can assure you at times it takes great power to be slow to anger. The statement Tozer makes in chapter 1 is convicting. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Consider how our relationships with a friend or coworker could be impacted based on how we perceived their character especially if our perceptions were misinformed or, worse of all, altogether wrong. How we understand God and his qualities is critical to how we live out our faith and make kingdom impact. One thing that, helps, one thing that might help us wrestle through all-powerful is defining and understanding the difference between what theologians would call absolute power and ordained power. Absolute power refers to what God may possibly do, but does not necessarily do. He could make ice cream and chocolate not fattening. He could have made the Chicago Bears win the Super Bowl. He could have saved the life of Jenny and Peyton's baby, but he didn't. God-ordained power denotes what he actually decreed according to his will and, and then provincially accomplishes. I'm not suggesting there are two separate and distinct powers in God's omnipotence. But instead, I'm hoping to help us understand his omnipotence in ways we see it displayed in Scripture, which is ordained power as opposed to theoretical what-ifs, which is absolute power. In Matthew 26, Jesus says, Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the Scripture be fulfilled? That it must be so. Absolute power would have been God, the Father, immediately sending legions of angels to protect Jesus. Ordained power 
was allowing the truth of Scripture to be fulfilled. Absolute power would have been providing salvation without crucifixion. Ordained power is the power that enables the creator of all we see and know to be hung on a cross as an atoning sacrifice for our transgressions. Another example where we see ordained power in Scripture is in Matthew 4. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Absolute power would have been Jesus easily turning the rocks into wonderful salted hot pretzels or maybe a bagel with some cream cheese. He did turn water into wine, so it's not that Jesus couldn't, it's that Jesus wouldn't. Jesus wouldn't because, because of what the Father had actually decreed according to his will and what he would eventually accomplish through Jesus. Interestingly, Jesus gives a fairly straightforward reason. He simply quotes scripture. Jesus points to Deuteronomy 8.3. As Mark Jones says in his book, God Is, we must resist the temptation to live in the theoretical world of God's absolute power. We should, however, trust in his ordained power according to the scripture. So on a daily basis, what does God's omnipotence mean to us as followers of Jesus? How do we wrestle through serving an all-powerful God who still allows suffering? So just as Jesus answers with scripture, when challenged to turn stones into bread, we should make that our first step when working to understand God's omnipotence. So rest in the knowledge that God is all-powerful and meditate on what the Father requires of us, to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. One practical way this can be accomplished today is through prayer. 1 John 5.14 says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So ask, if you don't know where to start with prayer, be encouraged by what Paul says in Romans 8, 26 and 27. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words, and he searches hearts, knows what's in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So today, spend time in prayer asking God to show you a greater glimpse of his omnipotence.